Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Melissa Rosenberg. I'm the executive director of the Howard County Autism Society and welcome to tonight's uh, webinar on supportive decision-making. Um, we're very excited to be presenting as someone said so soon after the, the new law has passed. Um, I wanted to, uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping uh, things. Um, Tonight we are offering simultaneous interpretation for Spanish speakers as we do with all of our webinars. Um, we're gonna to remain together for some welcome and instructions. And I'd like to introduce our interpreter, uh, Magdalena Castro Lewis. Um, Magda is from Luminous, which is a nonprofit here in Howard County, Maryland that empowers immigrants, refugees, asylees, and other foreign born individuals by helping them to access community resources and opportunities. Okay, um, our speaker tonight is Megan Rusiano. She's the managing attorney of the Developmental Disabilities Healthcare and Victims of Crime Act team at Disability Rights Maryland. Um, this is Maryland's federally designated protection and advocacy agency for people with disabilities. She founded and chairs Maryland's cross-disability supported decision-making coalition. She's a consultant on the judiciary's guardianship and vulnerable adult work group, faculty for the judiciary's training for court appointed, sorry. <laughs> What's my place there? Court appointed attorneys in guardianship proceedings and she was selected to participate in a group tasked with updating Maryland rule of professional conduct for attorneys who represent clients with diminished capacity. Prior to joining DRM in 2017, Ms. Rusiana was a client advocate at the Arc of Northern Virginia. She received her Juris Doctors from American University, Washington College of Law and University of Ottawa and a Bachelor's of Arts from McGill University. So welcome, Megan, and we're all very excited to hear about this new law. Wonderful, thank you so much, and thank you for the introduction and for having me tonight. I am gonna go ahead and share my screen. So give me a second here. Um, so, so this kind of, as we, we've discussed. Um, for folks who don't know Disability Rights Maryland, I hope you do. We are Maryland's, as it was mentioned, federally designated protection and advocacy agency for people with disabilities. What that means is that um, we provide free legal services to people across disabilities on a number of different issues. There is one of us in every single state so if you move, there should be a disability rights in the state that you move to. Um, in, here in Maryland, um, as I mentioned, I work on our developmental disabilities team. We also have a mental health team, a voting team, special education, uh, housing, um, representative pay, social security team, um, and others. So we, we basically, I like to say, um, we're a good source of referrals if we can't help you we try to connect you um, to people who can. So I wanted to start, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about the new supported decision-making law, of course, and how it fits in with guardianship and alternatives to guardianship. And so what I'd like to do is start with kind of basic understanding of the guardianship system, because to understand supported decision-making as an alternative to it, you kind of have to understand guardianship first. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and then I'll move to talk about the new supported decision-making law in Maryland and how it fits in to the guardianship system. Um, and then I'll talk about why consideration of alternatives to guardianship like supported decision-making is important. And then there are some resources at the end of the slides, and I will take questions. Um, it's easiest for me to take them at the end, um, but if something is burning, I can try to, I try to catch it in the chat. So when I talk about supported decision-making and alternatives to guardianship, I like to start with the concept of capacity. And what capacity is, is a person's ability to understand, make, and communicate a decision. It's their ability to indicate a will or preference and to act on it. 
What's important to remember about capacity is it exists on a spectrum that can vary depending on any number of factors, it can depend on the person's context. Is it early in the morning and I haven't had my coffee and you're asking me a very complex decision? Or is it late at night and I am you know, not a night owl and it's hard for me to, to comprehend what you're saying? Have I had a stressful day? Um, am I upset or overwhelmed? All those things can make it harder for me to make a decision for myself. It also can depend on the nature of the decision. So for me, I always say financial decisions aren't my forte. Um, I didn't go to law school to do math, um, not things that I regularly do. Um, so if you ask me complex financial decisions, it's not, you know, not my strong suit. Um, but for someone else, right, maybe they're a financial planner or maybe they really like numbers and those are really easy questions for them. So it depends too on the nature of the decision relative to the person. What's important to recognize about capacity and our ability to make decisions is that it usually happens, we usually exercise it through support. There are some decisions that people might need less support to make. So for me, um, if I'm hungry and it's dinner time, it's pretty easy for me to decide what I want to eat. Um, but if you want to ask me about how to manage my 401k or about how to finance a car, I maybe need more support. I may need to ask more people close to me to help me understand that decision and what I should or shouldn't do. Um, and then there are some decisions, of course, that are in the middle. But what's important to remember about capacity is that, again, it's your ability to make a decision and it exists on a spectrum um, that's gonna vary depending on the decision and how you're feeling that day. So when we talk about capacity, I always then like to talk about legal capacity because that's different, right? I can make a decision about whether or not I wanna buy a car, what car I wanna buy, what I wanna have for dinner, but legal capacity refers to whether or not I have the legal ability to make those decisions. So can I sign a contract? Can I sign a lease? Or can I provide consent to a medical procedure? I can decide where I want to live, but, but is that decision going to be recognized under law? It is if I have legal capacity. And everyone, every adult, is presumed to have legal capacity, even if they have a disability, you turn 18, that's the presumption. It's important to remember is that some people may have legal capacity to make certain decisions and not others. So I may struggle with financial decisions, but I still may be able to decide, hey, what you know supports or services I want um, or you know what kind of health care I should receive. What's important to remember too about capacity is that if a person or legal capacity is that if a person is found to lack it, they're vulnerable to guardianship. So in Maryland, there are two types of guardianship. There's guardianship of the person, guardianship of the property. So guardianship of the person is going to deal with your healthcare decisions, um, arranging supports, services, kind of your everyday lifestyle choices. Guardian of the property is going to look at just that property. What are your finances? Um, you know, what managing your assets, those kinds of things. If a person is under guardianship, they lose the legal authority. They lose their legal capacity to make certain decisions, depending on what the guardianship order says. And there are a couple of points that I try to make about guardianship because I feel like families um, sometimes get pushed into guardianship or, or told that they need to get it. Um, I'm not here to say it's not a tool in the toolbox. I think it definitely is. Um, but there are a lot of misnomers, misconceptions about guardianship. So guardian, of course, acts for the person. So if I have a guardian, I, I don't make, I can make my own decisions, but it's the guardian that's going to have the final say. Right. So if I decide I only want to have Oreos for dinner, guardian might have a different view on that. Or, um, you know, if I want to move into my own apartment, guardian might be able to say no. What is the another kind of 
critical point to remember about guardianship is that the court oversees the guardianship. The court is actually the ultimate guardian. So I hear a lot of folks saying, well, you know, I, I want to be guardian, child, they become an adult because I'm worried about somebody taking advantage of them. So I, I need to make decisions for them. That's understandable. It's generally what happens. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it's the court that decides. Um, so if the court doesn't think that you're doing a good job as guardian, they can get rid of you um, because they're the ultimate guardian. Um, guardianship inherently involves bringing the court into somebody's everyday um, decision making. A guardian has to file an annual report with the court um, to say, this is what, you know, this is how I'm making decisions. These are what decisions I made. Um, this is how the person's doing. Um, so it really, it's kind of missed on folks, um, is that it, it really is the court that's the ultimate guardian. The guardian's just an agent of the court. Um, the other point that I like to make is that adult guardianship is different than a parent's guardianship of a child. So, uh, you know, I, I know the conception is, you know, I'm guardian of my, my son or daughter. That's the, you know, that's the term that you, you use all throughout when folks are in school. Um, why is it different when they become an adult? Clearly, if I was a guardian when they were a minor, why would it be any different when they're an adult? Well, it goes back to that presumption of capability that I talked about, where all adults are presumed to have capacity, right, to make their own decisions. And what happens in adult guardianship is that it's ultimately taking away that that presumption from from an adult, it's taking away their ability to make really critical, fundamental decisions about their lives. So it's it's not the same um, as a as a parent child necessarily because a person has rights as an adult, and so it involves more of a adversarial court process, where um, you know when you petition petition for guardianship, there is um, an attorney that's appointed for the person with a disability. And it can get contentious. It can get contested. Somebody doesn't want guardianship. Um, that attorney is, is working for the person to preserve their rights, um, not for the parent or not for the petitioner. So the reason why there's that adversarial process is because there's all these rights at stake that, that you know adults carry. Um, like the right to vote or the right to marry. Um, and all of those can be at play in a guardianship proceeding. And that's why it's a little bit different. Um, and like I said, it's it's not really the same structure as parent for a minor. Um, you know, if I, my, I have a child, it, you know, it's not as though the courts get involved in, in my decisions unless they have concerns about my parenting. Um, you know, for the most part, I'm I'm living my life. But with adult guardianship, uh, it's different. The court is involved because the court's the ultimate guardian. So I think those are important things to look at for guardianship. Um, this is this slide kind of paraphrases um, what the standards are for uh, to appoint a guardian of the person and a guardian of the property. Basically, for both, it says that you have to be unable to make responsible decisions about your person or property due to a disability. And I always make two points on this slide. The first is, right, the standards say due to your disability. So I, as a person without a disability, can make irresponsible decisions about my person and property every day of the week, and nobody's going to threaten me with guardianship, right? It's only people with disabilities that can be placed under guardianship. So in a way, the standard's kind of biased, right? In a, in a way, it says, okay, well... Uh, you have to have a disability, and if you can't make responsible decisions, um, then then you might you might be vulnerable to guardianship. And I submit to you that very few eighteen year olds make really responsible decisions, whether or not they have a disability. Right? People learn and grow, and and you know learn to make better decisions after making worse decisions. Um, you know, I learned from my mistakes at eighteen when I did stupid things that eighteen year olds do, and 
I think I make better decisions now as a result of it. Um, but as a person without a disability, I, I wasn't at risk of guardianship when I made those stupid decisions, whereas a person with disabilities, maybe. Um, the other point that I make in talking about the standards is that you have to look at less restrictive alternatives. So when you file a guardianship petition, if anybody's ever done that, there is a checkbox to describe why less restrictive alternatives won't work. And less restrictive alternatives is a fancy legal term, basically means why other options, why other legal tools are impossible. Um, in practice, sometimes it's rubber stamped and just checked off and nobody looks at it. But in theory, according to the law, you, you have to prove why uh, those alternatives don't exist. And that's what we're going to get into today. I'm going to talk about supported decision making in a second, but I'd like to talk about it in context of other alternatives to guardianship. So sometimes I hear from families, you know, I got a call from the doctor and they're saying, as soon as my child turns 18, I'm not allowed in the doctor's office and I can't get any medical records. Well, I mean, technically that that is true, but only if the person really doesn't want you there, right? The, the uh, adult has the ability to sign a HIPAA form, so a consent to exchange uh, healthcare information, um, which would allow their parent or whoever it is to attend um, appointments with them to get medical information. And it's, you know, usually you get it when you um, go to a new doctor, you can ask your current doctor for it if it's an issue. Um, when I was 18, I, my mom's a nurse and I signed it so that she could have access. She could call about the appointments so she could get the information so she could attend appointments with me. Um, a person with a disability can do the same thing. Um, we know person-centered planning generally, right? When you're approaching services from the Developmental Disabilities Administration, um, they are person-centered. So, you know, other people can have opinions, but the focus of the process is what does the person want? What do they want and what support do they need to be able to make those decisions and use their own services? For financial um, alternatives, ABLE accounts, are a great option um, for folks who don't know. Um, of course, with our public benefit systems, unfortunately, can't have more than 2,000, 2,500, depending on the program, dollars in assets, um, which these days due to inflation is, is not, a, not a lot of money, right? Um, and so ABLE accounts are basically like a savings account for a person with a disability, and it lets them save money over that $2,000, $2,500 asset limit without jeopardizing their benefits. You use it on qualified expenses related to your disability, but that's generally interpreted pretty broadly. So it's a great tool for folks to be able to save money um, without worrying about benefits. Um, powers of attorney, um, talk about that too with the medical side. But if you're worried about somebody has any other assets and you're worried about being able to manage them, sign a power of attorney. Um, they can sign a power of attorney to give the person the ability to be their agent, to act for them. Um, everyone, whether or not you should, you have a disability should have a power of attorney. Um, I, I have one. I get to say that I have one now. I finally made mine. Um, it's, it's so important because there will come a time in your life when someone will question whether or not you can make a decision about your finances and or there'll come a time when you don't want to go do something about your finances. And it would be very helpful if you could pick someone to do that for you or to make the decision for you if you can't. And so power the standard to make a power of attorney is pretty low. Um, there's a statutory form um, for financial powers of attorney that's a bit complicated. Um, but the idea behind it is, do I want mom and dad or whoever it is to help me with my finances? And if I can understand that and communicate that some way, then I may be able to make a power of attorney. 
Special needs trusts I won't get too much into, but they're a great tool, again, to save larger amounts of money um, without jeopardizing public benefits. Um, there's a number of different programs, different ways you can approach special needs trusts. But again, they're a great resource. Don't, don't disinherit your, um, your child with a disability. Look at special needs trusts as, as vehicles to make sure that they you know, are able to access funds and, and um, resources in the future. Representative payees um, for veterans benefits or for social security are a great alternative. Um, social security does not care if you are guardian of the property. If you have a court order, they they don't care um, because Social Security is a federal is federal program, and each state has its own little guardianship system. So Social Security said instead of that, you if you need a representative pay if you need somebody to manage your Social Security money, you can have somebody appointed to do that, and you don't need a guardian. So I have seen people with really really significant disabilities who. You have representative payees for their social security, maybe have a special needs trust for inheritance, and use surrogate decision making, which I'll talk to out in a second for healthcare decisions, and never end up under guardianship. Um, and so I think, you know, there's there's a, here to kind of, I hope, put some parents at ease if all you've heard is this is something I absolutely have to do, and you know, the sky is gonna fall as soon as my child turns 18. There's a number of ways around that. Um, and so there's a number of tools out there. Of course, also right in Maryland, the default is that parents of a child with a disability who has an IEP will retain education rights until that child turns 21, age out of the system. Um, so, you know, you don't have to worry about being shut out of the IEP meeting. Um, the presumption someone has an IEP is that they will, um, the parents will retain the right. For medical, um, you look at advanced medical directives. It's basically like a healthcare power of attorney, it's sometimes called. I can appoint someone to make medical decisions for me if I don't want to, or if I'm not able to. Um, again, that standard is low. I want this person to help me with medical things. Um, you know, I should be able to make that. An advanced directive for mental health treatment is a great tool for folks to say, hey, this is the person I want to make my psychiatric decisions for me if I'm not able to. I do well on this medication. I don't like the side effects of that medication. I want to go to this hospital because they treat me better than that hospital. Um, all things you can specify in an advanced directive for mental health treatment. And then surrogate decision making. So sometimes I, I talk to folks who, um, you know, somebody maybe has a really more significant disability and if two doctors say, oh, I don't know if you can give medical consent, Megan, there is under Maryland law, a list of people in an order of priority who can make decisions for me. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to sign anything. It is just the law. Um, so first on that list is going to be guardian or power of attorney. Second on that list is spouse. If I don't have a spouse or my spouse is unwilling to serve, then it goes to my adult child. If I don't have an adult child or my adult child is unwilling to serve, then it goes to a parent. My don't don't have a parent, my parents are unwilling to serve, then it goes to my sibling. If I don't have a sibling or my sibling isn't willing to serve, it goes to a friend. So that is the list and the order. Only issue with surrogate decision making is you can't change that list or order. So sometimes I've been in situations where I've heard of people say, "Well, I don't want, you know, I I don't have anybody left. My parents aren't there, but I don't want my siblings. I want my direct support staff who's known me for fifty years to help me." And you're kind of stuck with the sibling because that's that's the order. Um, there are two types of decisions that surrogates cannot make. They cannot make um, decisions about sterilization and they can't make decisions about mental health treatment. The mental health treatment's more of a larger carve out. So folks have significant behavioral needs, may not be a, a good alternative for them. Um, but 
I say that because there's a lot of really good alternatives in Maryland that we can look to. We can kind of try out before trying guardianship. And there's one thing you take away from the presentation. It's it's that. It's that you can always go more restrictive. You can always go to guardianship if you need to get guardianship. But in practice, it's very hard <laughs> to get rid of guardianship if you um, if you have it. However, with the new supported decision-making law gives you some tools to look at how to do that. So what is supported decision-making? It's an alternative to guardianship that lets a person keep their decision-making ability without having to appoint somebody else. So how it works is that somebody's going to use their friends, family members, um, professionals to help them understand the choices and situations they face so that they can make their own decision. The thing that's different about supported decision-making is that the person retains their right to make decisions. So when we talk about things like surrogate decision-making or powers of attorney, technically, right, that's somebody else being able to make a decision for you, to be able to act for you. Supported decision-making isn't like that. Supported decision-making says, I make my own decisions. I just get help from this person. And it's sometimes framed as a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, I, I like that parallel because I always like tying things to federal law. It makes it stronger. So as an example of how that might work, um, right, people with disabilities under the ADA have a right to equal access, supports and services. So if somebody's receiving a service and it's provided to people without disabilities, a person with a disability has to have equal access to that same service. They have to be able to understand um, the service just as a person without a disability could. So example of this and how it might work with supported decision-making um, is from the pandemic, which is clearly still ongoing, but you know, there were all the hospitals who were saying, you know, you can't have visitors. And the Maryland Department of Health and the Department of Disabilities came out with joint guidance that said hospitals, you need to make reasonable accommodations to your visitor policies to let a disability support person in. So if I need my support person to come to the hospital with me so that I can understand what the doctor's saying, then you have to let that person in. Because in order for me to give informed consent, I need that person there so that I can understand what you're saying. It's kind of, you know, basically like saying, you know, if, if I use sign language, you need to let my interpreter in. It's the same idea. Um, but with supported decision-making, of course, if I need the support of someone else to help me understand the medical decision that's being asked of me, then I should have that person there. I have a right, I have an equal right to equal access, just as anybody else would, to understand that information and be able to get the support and accommodation I need to communicate my decision. So how does supported decision-making work in Maryland? We have this exciting new law that came into effect just earlier this month, October 1st. Um, so I wanna provide some context for it. Um, so we had a, Disability Rights Maryland received a small grant from our DD council to fund this um, cross-disability supported decision-making coalition. And the coalitions comprised of stakeholders from across disabilities, just as the title said. Um, and it consists of advocates, self-advocates, organizations, state partners, people across the board. Um, we have representation from the TBI community, the mental health community, the aging community. Um, we certainly have representation from people with disabilities. We have representation from the Department of Disabilities, the Behavioral Health Administration, the judiciary, um, <clears throat> among others. So. We've really brought a lot of people to the table and the goal behind it was how do we implement supported decision-making in Maryland? And um, really what was at the core of that was not only looking at legislation, but looking at education. Because we realized we could pass a bill. Um, we, did, we were able to pass it the first year, which was a small miracle, but even passing legislation doesn't mean a lot of people don't know what it is. Right. You got to educate teachers. You got to educate professionals. You got to educate attorneys. You got to educate the courts. You got to educate, you know, parents, 
people with disabilities, their supporters, the whole system. Otherwise, this isn't going to work the way that we imagined it. So that's been a real focus um, <clears throat> of the coalition, even though we've been able to pass the law this session. So the law that passed um, in the 2022 session was Senate Bill 559. <clears throat> and basically what it does is require that supported decision making be considered as another less restrictive alternative before guardianship can be imposed. So you remember back to when I was talking about the standards to be placed under guardianship, what well, already says you have to look at less restrictive alternatives, which would mean you have to look at things like powers of attorney and representative payees and all that. Well, now you also have to look at supported decision making and say why that wouldn't work before you can impose a guardianship. It can be used as a tool to prevent, limit, or end the use of a guardianship. Um, I know that there was a question before about, you know, is it going to limit my current guardianship? No. <clears throat> it doesn't inherently limit a person's current guardianship. Um, but if this is going to work for the person, if the person can make some of their own decisions with support, then technically go back to the court and say, eh, we can limit the guardianship. You know, this person can make some decisions about their DDA services. Um, I, you know, they still need a guardian for, <coughs> excuse me, they may still need a guardian for other, um, questions, um, or issues, but they may not need it for everything. And that's, that's the tool, um, for how it can, can limit a guardianship, make it, you know, a, not a plenary guardianship, but maybe you know, somebody can regain their right to vote or regain their right to marry. And also can be used to end a guardianship. If somebody doesn't need a guardianship anymore because they can use supported decision-making, you can go to the court and see if you can terminate the guardianship. Yet nothing about passing this law inherently changes <clears throat> the current authority of a guardian. It just makes it, <coughs> excuse me, so that, um, you know, it's another option, another tool in the toolbox to look to you know what you can do to regain somebody's rights. Um, <clears throat> supported decision making under the law can occur informally, or it can occur with a supported decision making agreement. So what that means is that <clears throat> I can make an agreement. If I make an agreement, I have to. There are some rules about what I can do, um, <clears throat> but I can also use it informally. I don't have to make an agreement. And where that's helpful is, <clears throat> let's say I have a, um, a, you know, an important surgery coming up and I don't want to make a whole agreement, but I just want to bring this person in the room with me to help me understand my discharge <coughs> procedures. I can do that using supported decision making. I don't have to make an agreement. I can say this person is my supporter and <clears throat> I need them to help me um, make, make this medical decision. Um, <clears throat> having a supported decision-making agreement doesn't prevent someone from acting independently of it. So just because I have it doesn't mean that I have to bring my supporter around with me everywhere, <clears throat> but that may be helpful, right? Uh, people may question my ability to make decisions if I don't have my supporter there. Supporters don't inherently have access to somebody's personal information. <clears throat> they would need to give consent to get that. Something that we snuck into the law, which I think is a great thing, is that the manner in which a person communicates is not grounds for saying that they can't make a supported decision-making agreement. So if I communicate non-verbally, if I use an iPad, if I use a letter board, um, if I use gestures, but I communicate, <clears throat> You can't restrict my ability to make an agreement. And most importantly, a supported decision-making agreement, using it doesn't impact the power of an agent under a power attorney or a healthcare agent under an advanced medical directive. <clears throat> so just because I make a supported decision-making agreement doesn't change those folks' authority. They can still make decisions for me. But if I have capacity, I can still make my own decisions, right? And I just might use supported decision-making to do that. 
So I see it as another tool in the toolbox. You know, you use supported decision making, maybe, you know, with with the folks who are your agents under a power attorney. And then if they have to act for you, they act for you if you're not able to. But you use supported decision making up until that point. So in Maryland, a person can select another person or a team of people <clears throat> to help them think through, decide, communicate their decisions. Um, <clears throat> They can choose both the types of decisions they want support with and the type of support that they want. So they can decide, you know, I want help with medical decisions um, and this is the kind of help I want. You can pick a person or a team of people. It's all individualized. Um, a supporter's job is to respect the person's decision ultimately, not make decisions for them. As I said, it can occur with or without an agreement. <clears throat> I know there were some questions around the use of supported decision-making and guardianship. So uh, I wanna make a distinction here between kind of the practice of supported decision-making generally and using supported decision-making as an alternative to guardianship. <clears throat> so a good guardian, right, is gonna use supported decision-making as the framework to help build somebody's self-determination so that they can make their own decisions and the guardian will honor that decision and help effectuate that decision for the person. Um, right, that's a good tool to, you can use supported decision-making informally in that way to help build somebody up so that they're more comfortable making decisions. And then maybe you don't need guardianship for certain things anymore. <clears throat> but by definition, right, you can use it as that kind of idea or concept by definition, supported decision-making is about the person making their own decision. And <clears throat> by law, right, you've under a person under guardianship's been um, found to not have legal capacity. So they can't make their own decisions um, legally. So, you know, when you talk about making a supported decision-making agreement, different from just using it as that principle <clears throat> within guardianship, if you're gonna, you know, sign a piece of paper that says this person communicates with, um, you know, uses support, um, you need to make sure that it doesn't impact the guardian's authority. <clears throat> so, if I have a guardian of the property, but I want to make a supported decision-making agreement about, um, you know, DDA services, my guardian of the property doesn't have jurisdiction over my DDA services, so I can use supported decision-making to do that. If I have a guardian of the person, though, and I want to make a supported decision-making agreement, well, since the court's the ultimate guardian, I'd have to go back to the court and say, is this okay? Can I use this agreement? So I want to make sure that's clear. It's a little bit tricky in the law. If you're making a formal agreement, if you're using supported decision-making formally, you're saying this person has the ability to make their own decisions. If you're using it that way, then you have to get the court's permission if it affects the guardian's authority because the court's the ultimate guardian. <clears throat> but if you're using it informally as a tool to build somebody's self-determination and you as the guardian are you know, making the decision that the person wants, then you can use it informally um, as a tool. Um, if you do make an agreement, um, you can, as I said, select the types of support that you want, some of which are listed here and they're listed in the bill. Supported decision-making agreements can't be required. Um, you can't be forced to sign somebody as someone, you can't be forced to sign one as a result of, um, you know, a, a service or a program. A supporter should maintain records about their actions and about how the adult communicates. The idea behind that was, you know, if you, People communicate in different ways, and it's really cumbersome if if somebody communicates in a non-traditional way for them to have to, you know, have every single person that they encounter relearn how they communicate. So it's kind of helpful for a supporter to be able to say, this is how this person communicates and expresses their own opinion, and I can provide this to you, third party, attorney, healthcare professional, whoever it is, so that you can communicate with this person. It helps them not have to re -go, th go through that process over and over again. Um, <clears throat> unless the person objects, 
a supporter should provide a copy of the agreement to any existing power of attorney, advanced medical uh, healthcare agent under advanced medical directive, or a trustee. Supported decision making isn't about hiding people away, right? It's about communities of support. It's about the idea that the people closest to a person know that person best. And so, you know, there shouldn't be any hiding with supported decision making, unless, of course, the you know, person's concerned. There maybe they are um, in a situation that's more abusive and they want to be able to say, no, don't, don't tell my power of attorney because they're taking advantage of me. Um, they can use supported decision making to get out of that abusive relationship. A supporter can't enforce decisions made by the adult. They can't go to the bank and empty the bank account. They can't go to the doctor and you know sign off on the procedure. <coughs> they don't have that authority. It's only the person, right? It's just that they use the support of another person to communicate their own decisions. And there are just a couple of restrictions on who can be a supporter. It can't be a minor, a person for whom the peace or protective order, or a person who's been convicted of financial exploitation. <clears throat> there are some rules about um, what needs to go into a supported decision-making agreement. There, I think another question on our on Disability Rights Maryland's website, there is a model form that was translated into plain language that has all those requirements. So I encourage people to look at that. <clears throat> Supported decision-making agreements don't need to be notarized. They just have to be witnessed by two adults who aren't a, the supporter or agent of supporter. Um, it has to be signed and dated in writing. You know, it has to describe the decision-making assistance that each supporter is going to provide, how if you have multiple supporters, they're going to work together, um, how any perceived or actual conflicts of interest are going to be addressed. So. People have conflict of interests um, kind of across their lives, and attorneys certainly have them a lot. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't mean that somebody can't serve as a supporter. It just means you're going to have to indicate what, you, what you're going to do. So, you know, if I provide direct support to someone and they choose me to be their supporter, maybe on DDA services, I bring in a monitor or I bring in somebody else to look over the decisions, um, just so that there's some additional eyes. On it. It's not prohibitive. Um, I can still pick that person, but I just have to talk about how it's going to work, how we're going to address any potential conflict of interest there, and how I chose the supporter. Did I point at them? Did I did I verbalize it? Um, how did I how did I do it? Um, and a person can receive whatever support they need to to change or revoke an agreement. So, what makes a good supporter? Um, <clears throat> they're going to understand their role. They're not going to influence or make decisions for someone. They're going to know how a person communicates and redirect others who speak to the supporter instead of the adult. They're going to consult with the person about how they want to be supported. They're going to acknowledge when they might not be the right person to make a decision, maybe, or help someone make a decision. Maybe they, you know, don't have all the information that they need. They're going to talk to the person about what's important for them not going to make value judgments about what's most should be most important to the person. They're going to make sure the person's in control of the process. <clears throat> Some tools a supporter might use could include plain language materials, um, advocating for somebody to have extra time, you know, helping ensure somebody has the accommodations that they need, role play, looking up pros and cons, taking notes, using persons in our tools. All those are strategies. So why are these alternatives important? Um, well, with supported decision-making, we know that over 25 states now um, have passed um, legislation recognizing supported decision-making. A bunch of state courts have actually terminated individual guardianships in specific cases in favor of it. So folks might be familiar with the Jenny Hatch case, 2016 out of Virginia. It's a case with a young woman with Down syndrome who was living independently and then got into a bicycle accident <clears throat> and her family petitions for guardianship over her. And she gets moved to a group home and she no longer is able to work. And she, you know, uh, petitions to terminate the guardianship. And, and so she uses supported decision making from 
as an alternative, use it relying on her her coworkers and her friends to help her make her own decisions. And she you know, gets her rights restored, is able to go back to work and move in to her own apartment again. Um, it's also important because the federal government's kind of funneled a lot of money towards it. Um, there's a National Resource Center for Supported Decision Making um, and a bunch of pilot projects that have been funded on it <clears throat> across the country. It's also been endorsed by a number of organizations, the American Bar Association, the National Guardianship Association in 2016, National Council on Disability, the American Civil Liberties Union, the ARC of the U.S., um, and the Uniform Law Commission, among others. There's, there's a lot of others, but the idea is that you know, this is something that's been around for a number of years uh, across the country. Maryland's kind of a, actually a little bit behind the eight ball um, since we just passed our law this year, um, but we're making progress. So now I'm going to show a quick video that talks about a young man and how he uses supported decision making. Um, this was out of a pilot project from the Ark of Northern Virginia. And I like his story because he communicates in a non-traditional way. He uses a letter board to communicate. And so often I hear attorneys or medical professionals say, well, you don't understand. This person is nonverbal. They can't make their own decisions. And I always say, telling me that they're nonverbal, that tells me nothing about how they communicate. It just tells me that they don't communicate using words. You haven't told me if they can use an iPad. You haven't told me if they can gesture. You have not provided any of that information. Um, and that's why I think Ben's story is a good one. So I'm going to quickly shop, stop sharing and then reshare and hope against all odds that um, my audio, hold on one second. Works very well. We'll see. That goes. Hopefully, folks can see that. Okay. And let me know if you hear this now. A good framework for learning how to participate in managing your own life. Thank you. 
So I like that example <clears throat> because it shows a little bit how supported decision-making can work in Ben's case, um, but also how it can work for somebody, again, who communicates in non-traditional non ways. And Ben can clearly communicate, he can express himself. <clears throat> he just needs the right tools to do it. And a supporter, you know, would make sure that he has the tools um, to do it and help translate and communicate those those decisions and his his words to other people. Um, so why are alternatives to guardianship important? Why should we look at supported decision-making as an option? Well, historically, we've denied folks with disabilities <clears throat> the ability to make their decisions. Um, you know, I talked about that presumption of capability. Sure, it's existed in law for all adults, but in practice, right, as a society, we haven't always presumed people with disabilities can make their, their decisions. And there's still a, a lot of really fundamental rights that are at stake in the disability rights movement. The right to live in the community, right? The right to marry or be able to um, vote, make your own decisions, choose where you live. Um, all of those things are our decisions, you know, be included in schools. Um, all those, all those choices are are things that are relatively new um, to folks with disabilities, and things that have been denied. They've been denied the ability to to access um, until more recently. All right, we still have institutions here in Maryland, um, and it's you know, I still represent folks who don't have the ability to decide what they're gonna what their schedule is gonna be or what they're gonna have for breakfast in a very fundamental way. So I think it's always important to remember, you know, this this comes, this is actually something that's really radical. It's actually something that's really difficult um, because historically as a society, this isn't what we've presumed for people with disabilities. Um, I have seen in practice people with disabilities be subject to unnecessary and overbroad guardianships. Um, that's not to say that I haven't seen people subject to guardianship that you know need to be under guardianship to some extent, um, but I've seen people be put under guardianship for a diagnosis. Just like I've heard people say, um, you know, this person's nonverbal, therefore, or people say this person has Down syndrome, or um, you know, this person has an intellectual disability. Well, that doesn't preclude them, <laughs> right, from being able to make their own decisions. Um, a diagnosis doesn't tell you very much about how a person communicates. Um, it just tells you medically they might have a disability. Um, alternatives like supported decision making are important because it respects a person's voice and their choice, um, regardless of how they communicate or what their diagnosis is. You know, we are our choices very fundamentally from how you cut your hair to what clothes you wear to how you decided to get into your profession. And those are so critical to how we see ourselves in the world um, and are just really critical to our growth. And in a lot of ways, you know, guardianship can, it doesn't mean that it necessarily has to, but it can prevent a person from being able to make those, those decisions that are so critical to how folks see themselves. Um, alternatives also help a person develop advocacy, self-determination and decision-making skills across time. Again, no one comes out making perfectly formed decisions. No one at 18, I guarantee, is making incredibly responsible decisions across the board, right? We all had a chance to learn and grow and really recognize that decision-making is a skill that evolves across time. And the thing about it is you can always start with a less restrictive alternative, and if it doesn't work, go more restrictive if you need to. Um, but giving folks the chance to kind of develop their decision-making skills, I think is something important. People, uh, you know, if you look at the advances that have been made in technology over the past couple of years, look at, look at how people can communicate using iPads now, things that weren't possible 15, 20 years ago. Now you have people regularly communicating, um, choosing less restrictive alternatives, trying to work with them, provides people that opportunity um, if in time they can grow to use assistive technology to communicate more, or if technology changes and, you know, suddenly we're able to communicate with more folks than we haven't been able to in the past. Um, and I just, I, 
I preface, I, I want to reiterate that, um, you know, when you look at guardianship generally, you, you should always, even after you impose guardianship, see if alternatives are available. It's an ongoing analysis. So when you're a guardian, you file uh, an annual report. And that report will ask you if guardianship is still needed. Well, if, if there's another option that like supported decision-making or a power of attorney that could be used instead, maybe, you know, you, you don't need guardianship anymore. You can limit it or you can terminate it. Um, you should be thinking about that throughout time because too often I've seen people end up under plenary guardianship, which means it takes away all their rights. And too often I've seen it be permanent um, when, you know, somebody can make decisions for themselves. Um, it's just a matter of, um, you know, the fact that the guardian has to identify that that's something that they're able to do. <clears throat> we know that people who are denied self-determination experience worse life outcomes. So people who are subject to overbroad guardianship have, you know, more of a negative impact on their their day-to-day -day functioning, which makes sense because if you are subject to an overbroad guardianship, if, if I can still make my med own medical decisions, if I can understand that and make those decisions, but when I go to the doctor's office, the doctor doesn't look at me, the doctor doesn't talk it to me, they only talk to my guardian, well, I'm going to feel like, what does it matter, <laughs> right? Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's an important point to try to, you know, limit guardianship where we can, um, ensure that it's not overbroad, and that people are able to express self-determination. Converse is true. So people who exercise greater self-determination have better life outcomes, more likely to live independently, work at higher paying jobs, um, more likely to identify situations of abuse and less likely to suffer abuse. Um, I think that one's important because if you teach somebody your voice matters and people need to listen to you, gives them the tool to stand up for themselves um, and identify situations where people aren't listening to them or taking advantage of them. Um, so I think you know, that's important. Um, I have this kind of closing slide uh, that I really like to use to underscore just the importance of being able to make your own decisions and direct your own life. And so, you know, I, I say if, uh, I always pause at the last one, if somebody made me eat carrot sticks all the time, and I could never have an Oreo, I would be pretty, pretty upset with my life, right? Um, we are so much, as I said, our choices, and um, it really has to do with quality of life and being able to make your own decisions. So I have some resources here. This is a slide that I should have broken up into multiple slides. Um, Disability Rights Maryland, as I said, on our resources page, we have a, a model agreement. It was made by the Supported Decision-Making Coalition and is in plain language. Um, the um, Autistic Self-Advocacy Network has a number of um, tools on their website that are in plain language. They have a toolkit that's very helpful. So does the ARC. Um, it's not here, but the ARC of the U.S. and the ARC of Northern Virginia, um, who did the pilot program with Ben, um, has one. I have included the bill text. Um, there are a couple of videos, too, that are, are great to watch. Um, all the way at the bottom, the Maryland courts actually did a series, a video series on alternatives to guardianship that will probably explain the alternatives that I talked about, able accounts, powers of attorney, representative payees, all of that, more in probably more plain language than I did. Um, they also have one on supported decision making. Videos are like three to five minutes. They're pretty short. Um, so if you have questions, that's a great resource to go to. Um, so I am going to stop sharing and see if I can take some questions. Um, Thanks, Megan. That's so great. A um, lot of great information. Uh, we do have a question here. What so, are the steps? What are the steps for getting assisted decision-making docs rolling? And does it, I saw, does it require, does it attorney? require does an attorney? Right? Does yep. not require an attorney. Um, I always encourage people when they fill out documents to talk with an attorney, but you don't need you don't need one um, necessarily. And so, you know, you can use something like the model form on our on our website to work through. If you have questions, I encourage people to reach out. Um, but the idea would be to 
you know, kind of initially before that for the person to identify, think through, you know, who you want your supporters to be. It's kind of a cumbersome process in a way, because, you know, it's people use people in different ways. You know, I, I may want somebody's help for one decision, but not another decision. I may want certain kind of help for them. So because I have so many choices, it's it's always good to kind of think ahead of time, hey, who, who would I want to help me? Um, you know, powers of attorney, advanced medical directives all require, you know, you pick somebody for a whole chunk of decisions, right? When you have a financial power of attorney, you're given that person the ability to make financial decisions for you. And that can span, depending what's in the power of attorney, from everything as little as managing your everyday bank account to managing your stocks, right? To helping you set up direct deposit, right? Those are all very different things, very different powers. Um, maybe you want different people's support with that. If you're using supported decision-making, you get to decide. You get to say, hey, you know, I would rather the finance person handle my stocks, but I can, you know, use my parent or use, um, you know, this other professional I know to help me, you know, manage my bank account. Um, so there really is a lot of options. So I encourage people to think through, but there's no requirement that you use an attorney. You're always more than welcome to contact um, us to, to kind of walk through. There are some attorneys um, who are versed in this, who will have forms of their own. Um, so you certainly can go to an attorney, um, but it's, it's not required. Um, so I saw additional questions. We got one about, uh, it seems like the focus of this is on communication help. Mm -hmm. Is there other good practice, other good uses of it in practice? Sure. I think that's a great question. So it can be things beyond communication help. So if, you know, it could be something like saying, um, if a person needs extra time, um, you know, if a person can communicate very well, but they're stressed out um, and it's not a good situation for them to make a decision, um, it can be ensuring that, you know, a person has the accommodations that they they need. Um, if that's, you know, access, if it is, you know, physically your building is inaccessible and so we can't come um, or we have difficulty, you know, the person has difficulty accessing that, it can be helpful with that. Um and there's really, um, you know, it could be just technically the law, right? The way that it's written, it applies to people without disabilities as well. It's going to be of great utility, certainly for people with disabilities, but as a person without a disability, I can make a supported decision-making agreement too. And I think it's a great tool because I may just want somebody to help me gather some information um, and get, you know, get the resources that I need so that I can make a decision. So it doesn't necessarily only have to be about, you know, communication or so. Supporters can have a number of different roles. Thank you so much. Um, how difficult it, is it to terminate guardianship? A great question. Um, so I'm going to do the classic attorney thing and say it depends. Um, <laughs> so if a, it, I, it really depends on your court your jurisdiction and whether or not the guardian is, is in favor. Um, I've seen a lot of cases where the guardian doesn't necessarily agree and then it's really hard. Um, but generally the process for termination can go a couple ways. Um, the, um, you can argue that the disability has ceased. That's the standard, which is really unfortunate for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities like autism because that's a lifelong disability. So by definition, right, it doesn't cease. But the argument is, you know, the disability is permanent, but its impact on my decision making may have ceased. So I may be able to make my own decisions now, even though I have this disability. It's just harder to prove in front of the courts, right? Courts, I mean, right, we're generally fighting for recognition um for for folks with with disabilities and so it's it's very hard for the court to you know make that make that determination you also need to find you could need to find medical professionals to say this person can make their own decisions now and i always say 
you know, they're usually have this as part of the slide, but I didn't, um, you know, you go for, um, to apply for public benefits if it's social security or it's DVA, and you have to compile all this medical evidence of how disabled you are, right? I, I advise people on eligibility all the time. And you have to have in excruciating detail all this evidence from doctors about what's going to happen to you if you're left alone in the house for 20 minutes. And I have seen doctors turn around based on that evidence and say and suggest to families, well, you should go get guardianship. And that's a completely different analysis, right? Whether or not somebody needs help with dressing or, you know, cooking doesn't mean that they can't make their own decisions. Um, so I say that just because our systems are set up so that families, parents are going to have tons of medical documentation about how disabled somebody is. It can be hard to get those same medical professionals to say, well, like they can make their own decisions now. So in theory, there are paths to terminate a guardianship. In practice, I've seen a lot of bias making it difficult to overcome. I will say if the guardian themselves writes in that annual report, I, I don't think I need a guardian. They don't, you know, I don't think they need a guardian anymore. That goes a whole long way. Because if you check off that box, then the court will hold a hearing and you know can make a determination that guardianship isn't needed anymore. Um, so I would say it's it's easier if the guardian certainly is is willing to check that box. It's can be harder um, to get the me medical evidence um, if the court requires it um, or if the guardian contests it. So I hope that that was helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned voting. Can someone with supported decision-making vote? Is it different under guardianship? Great question. So somebody who uses supported decision-making can vote. I, you know, if you need, uh, I argue that I think a lot of people vote using something like supported decision-making, you talk to people who share your values and your preferences, and you talk about what candidates you're looking at. You, I mean, I, I ask my wife where she's gotten, you know, her information. Does the Baltimore Sun have good write-ups on the candidates? Um, you know, where have you looked to get information? We all use it to some extent. So person using supported decision-making can certainly vote. Um, in Maryland, even if you're under guardianship, it's not necessary that you, um, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't vote unless that right was taken away. So you have to look at the guardianship order and see if it says whether or not the person can vote. It has to name it specifically um, if it's taken away. So, um, you know, you would be looking to see if it's part of that order. Um, but you know, if a person needs um, assistance to, to get to the voting booth or if they need help, um, they can they can do that as long as clearly they're the one making the decision about who to vote for. But I would argue a lot of us use supported decision making to figure out who we're going to vote for. So um, I hope that was helpful. That's a good point. Good point. Um, will this document definitely allow you to go into a hospital setting uh, if they're not letting extra people in due to uh, pandemic or other situations, or can they still deny you entry? Great question. Um, so I will say that in theory, if you have this, um, and if it's needed for medical, or even if you don't have an agreement and you're just saying I'm the person supported, that they should let you in. Um, but as I always say, if everybody followed the ADA, I would be out of a job and I could, I don't know, go like run a concession stand on a beach, do something else, um, which is fine. But, you know, it, it's if people we've we dealt with these situations in the hospital, even after um, I mean, even if somebody had guardianship, they were they weren't letting they weren't letting folks into hospitals. So if you know, if you are encountering issues, if somebody is saying this person's my disability support person, this person's my supporter, I need them in the hospital, and you're being denied, then you can contact me, contact our office, and we can we can help um, on that because it's not only supported decision-making. If the person has a disability, the ADA also applies. And so it's, it's kind of a, a double argument at this point. 
So I wish I could say with certainty <laughs> they they will let you in. I think a lot of hospitals have improved on this, um, but I can't guarantee it. But I can say if there's an issue, you can feel free to reach out. And I had a question, Megan, just, you know, um, like maybe you get somebody who's a guardian who you're very uncomfortable with or you feel is, you know, abusing you or misguiding you. You know, what if you you pick a support person who um, mm -hmm. um, you, you're no longer feeling comfortable with and and is that a how do you undo that? Right. So is the question really? You know, if you have a supporter who is you know, similar to having a guardian who you're not necessarily right. feeling. Yeah. Right. So you can, the thing about supported decision making in the law, it says that you can revoke it or change it at any time and you can receive support to do so. And when you revoke it, um, the supporter has an obligation. If, you know, it's on file anywhere you can do it too. Um, let's say give it to your doctor so they would know. Well, supporter has an obligation and you have the ability to say, this is void. This is not, we're not using this anymore. Um, so the idea is that it should be pretty easy um, to change. Uh, in practice, I can say that's, you know, it's important because you know, the people in my life who I would have used as supporters five years ago are, are different. Your friendships change, you grow, you have different people who are most important to you, you may move, um, all those things impact it. So if I really envision these, these agreements being updated. Um, and so I, I think, you know, you, you definitely as the person have the ability to change it. And if you need help to revoke it, um, then you can get that help if that's from another person. It, it speci the law specifically recognizes that you should get any support or accommodation that you need to be able to change it because um, we don't want people to be stuck with their supporter. Um, what's also helpful with supported decision-making is um, by definition and in the law, um, even if I, you know, don't, if it, if, in the case that I don't um, want my supporter anymore, I'm still able to make my own decisions, right? I, I don't have to bring my supporter with me anywhere I go. I can act independently of the agreement and I can assert my right to do that. So it also gives folks an out because not only can you revoke it, but you also never lose your decision-making authority. So you can always um, act independently of it if you need to. Thank you, that's great. Um, once you make the document and get it signed, can you use a copy to give to doctors or do we need several original signed documents? And I know that's kind of the case with medical directives, wells. I mean, I don't know what all the rules are, but what do you it's need? A, it's a great question. You can do a copy. I mean, the doctor's office shouldn't be um, <clears throat> requiring an original Um if they do, I mean, I could see banks maybe requiring an original, um, but, uh, you know, if, if that's a barrier, it doesn't have to be because the agreement needs to be witnessed by two people and all signatures need to be witnessed. So the supporter needs to sign, the person needs to sign, and two witnesses need to witness all those signatures. So it could be a bit cumbersome to get all those people in a room um, to do it again. So I, I would say copy should be fine. There's no requirement in the law. Um, but I, I can't say how doctors will interpret it, but if you do encounter barriers with that, um, feel free to let me know. It's a good question. That is a good one. Thank you. Um, if, so, if supported decision-making agreements are not working and you want to pursue guardianship, what's the court needing to see, uh, to show supported decision-making agreements were not working? So it's, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, in theory, you could you could say we we tried it out and the person was still not able to make their own decisions or, um, you know, even though we used it, decisions weren't being recognized or the person got taken advantage of, whatever it was. Um, there's not hard and fast evidence the court requires and the, the petition for guardianship just requires that you, you talk about why it doesn't work. And it can honestly be like we we tried it and you know 
person still wasn't able to make their own decisions. Um, and so I think, you know, that's, it can be as simple as, as that. Um, you don't need to have intensive records. Um, but it does, again, give you the option to try it out. And if it doesn't, you can always, you can always go that route. Um, as I said, kind of before, even though the law says you have to look at less restrictive alternatives, um, and I firmly believe that you, you should, um, because that's the law, in practice, sometimes I see it rubber stamped. Oh, you know, this person just can't create a power of attorney. Well, that doesn't tell me a lot. Can they not understand it? Um, do they not have the supports they need to, you know, to be able to understand it? What, what is it? Um, do they not have someone willing to serve? Um, maybe that's an issue. Um, you know, some explanation is always helpful in that way. But it's not as though you'll need to have, you know, pages on pages of evidence of what you've done. Um, it can be as simple as a sentence. Thank you. Uh, if the individual makes a decision on their own against their support person's advice and then changes mm -hmm. their mind later, are there ways to change the decision? Uh, any time limit? So, um, you know, something once, just like anybody's decision, once you make the decision, it's, it's yours to own. Um, but, you know, things that there's no specific, um, you know, time limit on if you can retract a decision. Although I find in practice, you know, it's, it's very rare that there's a decision that you can't change your mind on. Um, you know, I recently went to the doctor and had a, you know, they asked if I wanted a referral for, to see another doctor about an issue. And I said, no. And then I talked to my wife about it. I thought about it a little bit more and I was like, well, I should have actually done that. That was the right thing to do was to get the referral. So I just called the doctor's office back and I got the referral. So there's no, um, you know, there's no like kind of, um, the example that I'm looking for, the words I'm looking for, that, that ability to unsend an email, which is brilliant. There's no ability to do that with decisions, but in practice, you may have more wiggle room. Um, but it's also important to know that the person owns their liability, the supporter doesn't have liability. Um, so if, if, you know, the person I'm supporting decides that, you know, they want to spend $500 on a I don't know, on a pair of new shoes instead of thinking about their rent, I'm not, I'm not liable. Talk to them about their consequences and they make their own decision. Um, but, you know, for the most part, a lot of decisions you can, you tend to be able to work out in practice. Um, I, I just wanted to follow up. I know we talked about hospitals, but it, it seems like that if, if somebody has is um, set up for supported decision making and then becomes ill or there are mental health issues. Um, you know what? How does how will this how will this work? It's a great question. So that's why I always encourage people to have powers of attorney, um, and you can use supporters to understand to you know to help you understand those legal documents. So, um, you know, again, when I made. My power of attorney, I talked to my wife, who's also an attorney, about what the provisions meant. And we talked it through and, you know, we we signed them. I used I used supported decision making to, to create it. But you're going to need to have those documents because there's a time when somebody's not going to believe you can make a decision. But I'm a firm believer that I want supported decision making all the time. Um, even if, you know, my partner is going to make a decision for me. I want her to talk with me about what I want. I want her to ask me, right? Because when I'm, even when I'm unwell, if they're, you know, I, I might not be making the most rational decisions, but there's oftentimes some thread of truth in, in what I'm feeling or what I might have concerns about. And somebody who knows me really well, it should be talking to me and trying to make, you know, the decision that I want to make and do it in a way that's, you know, responsive to me. Um, I often say that sometimes supported decision-making is like um, mental health first aid when somebody's in crisis. 
you know, how, how do you approach somebody who's behaviorally in crisis? You know, you don't want to escalate. You don't want to make it seem as though, you know, they're completely irrational. And, you know, you try to diffuse the situation, right? You use those techniques to, to bring people down and to try to get people to recognize where they are and that they may need some help. That's like being a supporter. They want you to help in those situations. That's kind of how you're using it. So I think to get back to your your question more directly, you're always going to have to use um, other tools if, you know, like powers of attorney, if you're not able to make your decisions. But you can use those principles of supported decision making to make sure a person feels, you know, as much in control of the situation as they can and that you're making decisions that, you know, they would want. Thank you. Um, we have one more question. Sure. Uh, who is legally responsible for a disabled individual's actions or decisions if they are under guardianship or under supported decision-making? So under guardianship, um, I have to look back at the standards. Um, I think that it depends on what the guardian knows um, about what goes on. I mean, you know, a person under guardianship commits a crime. It's not as though the guardian's liable, um, you know, or can be imprisoned, but sometimes, you know, if there's been neglect or you haven't been watchful eye as a guardian, um, you may open yourself up to liability if, if you haven't, you know, acted with care, um, in the situation. That's my general understanding. I caveat that with, I don't, I don't practice that regularly. Um, under supported decision-making supported doesn't have liability, um, because, you are, um, you know, you're not making the decision for the person. Now, if you act inappropriately, if you make a decision for the person or you go to their bank account and <laughs> empty their bank account, that's not, you know, using your authority, that's acting beyond the scope of the agreement, then you might be liable because that's, you know, that's theft, that's doing something you shouldn't be doing. Um, but inherently as a supporter, if you're just helping somebody and they make a decision that you you don't agree with um and they get in trouble for it that's that's their decision and there's a loan that's not yours um to hope that that was that was helpful that was great yes we got to thank you it's just awesome to me so <laughs> this is great megan thank you we are just about at 8 30 so um what a what a lot of wonderful information and a and a really valuable, important topic. Um, lots of thank yous here in the chat. Thank you. Um, we really appreciate your time and expertise and uh, we will be sharing the recording and Megan's slide deck um, in just a few days. So thank you all for joining us and um, thank you, Megan. Thank you all for having me. Everybody have a good night. <laughs>